Today's episode is brought to you by our listeners and supporters over on our Buy Me A Coffee page. Thank you to all who support the show by giving our show a listen, leaving a review or comment, following us on our Twitter, or sharing the show with your friends and family. If you want to support the show further, check out our BMAC page for more information. Link will be in the description below. Hello, and welcome to Into the Night, a Finance of Freddy's podcast. I'm your host, Nick, and thank you for listening. Do you know how important you are? On this question, do you know how special and amazing you are right now? It may be hard to recognize your worth when we live in a world that is filled with nihilism, or the lesson and importance of life are only recognized when you reach the final steps of maturity. And for far too many people... Only when they see the end of the rope do they recognize how much they were truly worth. Every human life is not only important, but also precious and serves a purpose. It may not be important to you, and it may not serve your purpose, but it might be important and purposeful to somebody else, or to the world at large. Mitch Albom once wrote that you learn five lessons in death that you rarely ever fully comprehend in life. Those lessons go as follow. Everything happens for a reason. The sacrifices you make have an impact on the lives of other people. Forgiveness of others is just as important as the forgiveness of oneself. Life is limited, but love transcends death. And every human life has a purpose. If you are a good person, not the best, not the most perfect, just a good person. Unfortunately for some people, this lesson gets twisted and they start to believe a lie. They start to believe that everything happens for the worst. Humanity lies for their own benefit and makes each other's lives worse in the process. Changing for forgiveness is pointless in a rotten world. Love is a lie and death is eternal. And every human exists to be exploited for one's own entertainment. It's a terrible and lonely life to live. A worldview that, once pushed to a breaking point, can become a stepping stone to the path of destruction or worse, insanity. This is episode 23. Count the Ways. You see, 
It's not a question of if, but how. The choice is all yours. But it'll be my pleasure to present you with some options. Options of how to die? Inside a large Victorian house in the middle of Utah that has stood for over 150 years, inside a strange little room where someone surely had died at some point, lay a girl clad in black clothing in a similar dark attitude. The fact that someone may have died in her bedroom previously suited her just fine, though. She appreciated the aura it left in the room. Millie Fitzsimmons, a name she had always thought suited an animal like her cat more than a person, was currently living in her grandpa's house for the year. Her unreliable parents, whom she did love, were the type of people who never thought things through, like how hard elementary would be with a name that rhymed with silly. Her parents were job hoppers, flipping from one occupation to another. Over the summer, her dad had been offered a teaching job in Saudi Arabia. Millie's parents gave her a choice then. She could either go with them on this adventure, as they kept saying, or stay with Grandpa for a year. To her, it was a lose-lose situation, as she was either going to have to be homeschooled by her mom or start anew at a high school near her grandpa. After lots of tears and angry rants, Millie decided to spend a year with Grandpa. It beat having to be stranded in a foreign country in her mind. At the very least, she could still be with her cat, Annabelle Lee. She was a black cat that was named after one of her favorite characters from her favorite poem. Edgar Allan Poe. And her grandpa did have a nice house, although it was filled to the brim with all kinds of junk. Millie's grandpa was a collector of strange items. Some made sense, like various plates from different states that he had visited with his late wife. But the wall the plates adorned was oddly paralleled by the opposite wall decorated with swords and other medieval weaponry. Life-size suits of armor stood guard next to taxidermy animals around the house. Porcelain doll heads were displayed beneath glass in a room filled with old electronic components. She couldn't understand what exactly he was collecting, or for what reason. She surmised it was just a habit of being a tinkerer. He always did have a scientific look about him, with his wispy white hair and his tan cardigan and glasses. He was a good grandpa, though. He was a decent cook that even asked her for the meal she would prefer to eat because he knew she was a vegetarian. He always said that she should eat some meat because she looked pale, but she preferred that look. She even wore a sheer light powder to make her face look even paler to contrast the black eyeliner and black clothing she favored. He was trying her best to make her happy, but it was a waste of energy. In her mind, she wasn't a happy person, and she was glad she wasn't. In her mind, anybody who was happy was just lying to themselves about reality. In her miserable room, Millie opened up her laptop and began reading some of her favorite poems about death. Anne Lee, The Raven. She had just read a new one by Emily Dickinson that was about death picking up a girl for a date. A date with death. The thought made Millie lightheaded. She thought of death as a handsome, black-coated stranger who would save her from the misery that was her homework, her school life, and her pointless existence. She imagined he looked just like her favorite singer, Kurt Carrion. Inspired, she grabbed her black leather journal and began to write. Oh death, show me now your ravaged face. Oh death, how I long for your chilly embrace. Oh death, my life is such a misery that only you can set me free. When she was satisfied with her poem, she sighed with dread at what lay before her. She closed her journal and took out her algebra home. She hated math more than any other subject because what was the point of algebra in the face of human beings' inevitable mortality? The only reason she even tried in class was that if she didn't, her grandpa would take away her allowance, and she was trying to save up for some jet morning jewelry. As she was finishing up her first page of assignments, she heard a knock at her door. Her grandpa had walked in with a plate full of warm cookies and a glass of milk. Study fuel, as he liked to call it. 
Millie was at first dismissive, stating that she wasn't a kid whose happiness could be bought with a few cookies. But the moment her grandpa asked if he wanted her to take them away, she quickly asked him to leave them. He put the cookies on her desk with a smile and let her know that he was going to tinker in his workshop, messing around with some new electronics he found in the salvage yard. She waited until he was down the stairs before she devoured the cookies. Despite the futility of life, there was nothing more satiating than chocolate. Options of how to die! Exactly! Now you're catching on! Bright girl that you are! Now I call the first couple of options the lazy choices. They don't require me to do anything but keep you here and let nature take its course. The advantage to these is that they're easy peasy for me, but not so easy for you. You'll be slow with lots of suffering. Well, who knows? That might appeal to your morbid sensibilities. Lots of opportunities for languishing. You like languishing? What do you mean? Example! Dehydration is one option. No water at all. And you can start dying in as few as three days. Or as many as seven. You're young and healthy, so I put my money on it taking you a while. Depriving the body of water has fascinating effects. With no fluids coming in to filter and flush, the kidneys shut down, and your body starts to poison itself, making you sicker and sicker. One of those poisons have time to build up. You can suffer total organ failure, or a heart attack, or have a stroke! But that's death for you. So glamorous. So romantic. Are... are you making fun of me? No, not at all, my dear. I like you, Millie. And that's why I'm here. To make your wishes come true. I'm like a genie. Except you're the one who's trapped in a bottle. Starvation's another classic, too. But that's a real slow-moving train. It takes weeks for the body to use up its stores of nutrition and break down all its proteins and turn on itself. It can take weeks. Some people have even lasted a couple of months. That'll never work. Grandpa comes in here to putter around after dinner every night. He'll find me. How so? He'll hear me in here. I'll scream. Scream all you want, lamb chap. It's soundproof. No one will hear you. And after a few days, it won't even matter. You'll be too weak to scream. Winter break was just one week away. The entire town was decorated with wreaths, Christmas trees, and the occasional menorah. Millie didn't even understand why people got so excited about the holidays. They were just a momentary distraction to fabricate some form of happiness in the face of life's utter meaninglessness. No matter how many times someone wished her a Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays, she wouldn't say it back. Now that she was a popular person in school to talk to to begin with, when she walked down the halls, a wide berth in the foot of traffic would always appear in front of her. At school, her pale look and dark clothing had earned her the nickname of Dracula's Daughter. Mockery was a common occurrence even before he had worn the dark clothing, however. The Fitzsimmons family was seen as the town weirdos with a tendency to start projects with enthusiasm before abruptly abandoning them. Even their old home, Millie Dad had planned to paint it with an expensive soft blue with cream trim but gave up once he finished the front of the house. Millie's mom told her that nobody would have noticed, like when you have a Christmas tree and you position it to so the ugly side faced the wall. People noticed. 
Millie's grandpa often had to help her parents pay the bills. They weren't poor, but by the end of the month, they did always end up having a week of pancake mix and box macaroni and cheese. Her grandpa was also weird like her parents, but he was also a successful high school teacher and investor, so he was given the title of eccentric rather than weird. Some thought Millie's father taking the job to teach in Saudi Arabia was him following his father's footsteps and getting his act together finally. But Millie knew he would eventually abandon the project like every other one he started. Meanwhile, while they were gone, she would endure being the social outcast of the town. In the cafeteria with the sounds of hundreds of teenagers talking and laughing, her eyes caught her old elementary school friend. Her name was Hannah. She and Millie were inseparable up to the fifth grade until popularity began to take more precedence over Millie. But Millie only saw Hannah accept the crumbs of acknowledgement from popular girls rather than having a real friendship with her. Millie sat alone, like usual, nibbling on her egg salad sandwich with apple slices her grandpa had made for her. She was managing to drown out the noise of the cafeteria by reading the tales of mystery and imagination. But she couldn't help but feel she was being watched. She looked up from her book to see a lanky boy with horn-rimmed glasses and frizzy hair dyed red. Both their ears were studded with silver earrings, and he wore a clean, dark leather jacket. He nodded to the seat across from her and asked if anyone was sitting there. Millie was confused. Nobody had ever asked to sit with her before. She responded that the only person sitting there was her imaginary friend. Another oddity, she never joked with people at all either. The boy sat down and introduced himself as Dylan, a new student who had just moved from Toledo. He gestured towards the book Millie was reading with fingernails polished black. He recognized it as Poe's work and admitted he loved H.P. Lovecraft and all the old scarier writer. No one had ever taken an interest in the same stories Millie enjoyed. Dylan asked if the school was as lame as it seemed. Millie marked her book and for the first time in a while she was engaged in a conversation. They talked for the entire lunch period Millie even blushed a little when Dylan commented her on her earrings. Where had he come from? Sure, he said Toledo, but Millie had never seen someone so sophisticated and knowledgeable. The bell rang, signaling the end of the lunch period. When Dylan began to clean up, he asked if it was alright if he could join Millie and her imaginary friend for lunch tomorrow. Millie said she didn't mind at all. She had a bit of a pep in her step throughout the rest of the day, but always made sure to keep it subdued so she wouldn't appear even stranger to the other students, and she doubted it had anything to do with her black coat and scarf she boned herself in to avoid hypothermia. See? I had thought about freezing you to death too! I thought I could short out the power in here so the space heater turns off, and my metal body it Pretty cold! But I figured your grandpa would come in and notice that the power is out of this precious workshop and would fix it right away. So freezing you to death is a no go. -go. Sorry if you had your heart set on that one, sweet pea. I don't understand. Why do you want to kill me? I just think you should ask. There's a couple reasons, actually. The first is quite simply that it's something to do. I sat in that salvage yard for ages before your grandpa found me and brought me here, where I've just been languishing. I'm born out of my skull. Not that I have a literal skull, but you know what I mean. Aren't there other things you could find to do besides killing people? Uh, not so interesting. Plus, there's my second reason, which is that death is what you want. You've been mooning around since you moved here, talking about how you want to die. Well, I like to kill people, and you want to die. It's a mutually beneficial relationship, like those little birds that pick the parasite off rhinoceroses. The bird gets to eat, and the rhinoceros gets rid of the itchy little butts. We both get what we want. Win win! I spoke about death. I wrote about it. But I always just thought it was interesting. An idea to play around with. I don't want to die. Not really. 
For dinner, Grandpa made spaghetti and was shocked to see Millie actually eat something. Millie had told him her day wasn't completely terrible. She had met someone who was kind of cool. Grandpa asked, in an insinuating tone, if the person had to be a boy or a girl. Millie had to fight back her smile, but told him that it was in fact a boy. But they just had a friendly conversation, and that was it. Millie's grandpa was happy to hear it nonetheless. I started to reminisce about Millie's grandma and how they met through conversation. They were high school sweethearts who then went to the same college. They got engaged in the senior year of college and married in June right after they graduated. His eyes went soft and misty. He lamented how it was unfortunate Millie never got to meet her. She was special. Millie related it to Annabelle Lee and Grandpa acknowledged it and recited a verse. It was many, many years ago in a kingdom by the sea. Millie was shocked to hear him recite one of her favorite poems, but Grandpa was a literate man, and he had read Poe and a lot of other writers. He looked at Millie with a look of sadness in his eye. He told her that he knew she liked Poe because he was dark and spooky, but it was easy for her to romanticize death because it was so far away. But Poe's intention was not to romanticize it. He wrote about death because he lost so many of the people he loved. Millie had never experienced that kind of loss. The loss that changes you. Millie never really thought of her grandpa's feelings before then. Never thought how he must have felt when grandma became sick and died. How lonely it must have been after she was gone. Millie thanked him for dinner and went upstairs. But when she got into her room, she didn't think of death. She thought about Dylan. With her grandpa's words lingering in her head, she recited Annabelle Lee. Although this time, it sounded like a poem of love rather than one of death. It had been a while since she felt something pierce her heart. Now, I'm not a 
prince. And I can't inspire to that level of achievement. But one little old Impele can't be that hard, can it? I can just take one of my metal rods and drive it through my body cavity. And it'll go straight through you and out the other side. If the spikes go through your vital organs, death comes quickly. If it doesn't, there can be some hours of bleeding and suffering. The people who walk through the forest of the Impale talk about the moaning and gasping of the victims. So, Impaling? One might say other deaths impale in comparison. <laughs> he can work quickly or slowly, but the result is the same in the end. Like I said, win-win. I want my mom. I want my dad. I want grandpa. I would do anything if one of them could hear me. I'd even put on a Christmas sweater if it made them happy. And the next day, Millie sat expectantly at the cafeteria for Dylan. When she finally saw his fire engine red hair, she was hoping her excitement wasn't showing. He sat down with her again, and before they even began talking, he pulled out a book from his leather jacket. H.P. Lovecraft's Call of Cthulhu. Millie's face was trying its hardest to fight back a grin. Her heart soared not just because he gave her a book, but because he thought of her when she wasn't in her present. He remembered their conversation, remembered the book they talked about, remembered to bring it with him the next day, and remembered to give it to her. And that was the part that made her blush. He remembered her. After dinner, when she got home, she immediately went into her room and started reading the book. Dylan was right. It was weird. Weirder than Poe's stuff, even. And scary in a way that Millie appreciated. It was the perfect gift Dylan could give her. Millie wasn't a flowers and candies type of girl anyway. After she read a couple stories, she opened her laptop. Instead of googling stories of death, she looked into stories of love. She found one by... Elizabeth Barrett Browning that read, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. She had read it before when she was younger, only seen as pretty meaningless words. But now she understood them. She understood the strong feelings one can have when in the presence of someone that truly understands you. And you understand them in return. She took out her black leather journal and thought. Finally, she wrote, you clipped away the black thorny vines that twisted around my wounded heart so it could beat and feel relief from pain. You are a gardener who wakes the plants from the gray, chilly death of winter so that they can blossom again like my heart, a slow blooming blood red rose. She read the poem back and gave a satisfying sigh. Not too overly dramatic and just enough heart. Her mood only darkened slightly when she had to put her book aside to begin on her homework. But even the mundanity of schoolwork couldn't nullify the electricity in her heart. Quickly. If it doesn't, 
you'll have some nasty burns, and your heart will go into fibrillation, which will generally kill you if you don't have help. And I think we've already established that you don't have anyone here to help you. <laughs> So what do you think, Cupcake? Electrocution? You'd be shocked at how effective it is! An electrifying good time! A good time for you, not for me. Why did I have to be so obsessed with the negative? Why couldn't I chase that flicker of happiness I had a little longer? On a Saturday afternoon, when most kids were at the malls or movies, Millie walked down to the public library. It had become her regular routine for the weekend. Today, she roamed the library looking for a perfect dark material. She had finished The Call of Cthulhu and was disappointed that she couldn't find any more Lovecraftian literature on the shelves. But she did find something. Her heart skipped a peak when she saw Dylan in the same book section. What were the odds that stars would have lied to meet him outside of school? They once again started up a beautiful conversation on horror literature, with Millie lamenting how she couldn't find any more Lovecraft books. Dylan, with a thoughtful expression, scanned the shelves and pulled out a thin book with a black cover, The Lottery and Other Stories by Shirley Jackson. It wasn't Lovecraft, but Dylan said she was the perfect author to continue her horror pursuits. Dylan handed her the book and offered a seat next to him where he was reading. Millie accepted and tried her best not to show how happy that made her. Millie enjoyed talking with Dylan, but sitting next to him and reading? And the quiet times were nice, too. She read through the whole book with her mouth hanging open, something Dylan commented on a few times while she was reading. Once she was done, Dylan offered her an invitation to the cafe next door for some tea, which she accepted quickly, of course. She had always walked past the cafe, it always looked cute, but she never went inside. Over a hot cup of tea, Millie and Dylan began discussing their aspirations. Millie told Dylan that one day she would love to be a librarian, maybe an intelligent-looking one who wore a bronze nays. Talking with Dylan and having lunch with him, it made Millie's days better each morning. She would spend her time waking up looking forward to seeing him and an afternoon dissecting what they had said to each other. Sure, on paper it could be seen as a little silly for spending so much time thinking about a boy, but to Millie... Dylan was no ordinary boy. Millie was at home watching her grandpa, wearing a sweater with sewn-in Christmas trees baking cookies. When asked about the occasion, her grandpa explained he was going to be a chaperone for the holiday bazaar at her school, an end-of-the-year winter celebration for the student body. Millie thought the event was stupid, just a bunch of people selling ugly Christmas ornaments and low-quality home-cooked meals and desserts. But now her grandpa was telling her that they should go together. Normally she would have said no, but she also thought it would be nice to give the old man something he wanted. Besides, they never went out much. Plus, there was also a chance Dylan could be there, under duress like her, and they could make her own event together if she went. The school halls were decorated with Christmas lights and cut-out snowflakes, with classic Christmas songs playing over the loudspeakers. Millie and her grandpa ate their fill of home-cooked chili and warm shirt cookies before she began wandering around the halls. She pretended to be looking for the craft displays and ugly ornaments for sale, but she was really searching for Dylan. She eventually found him in the second floor hallway, but not in the way she wanted to. Dylan was standing in front of a booth selling reindeer Christmas decorations made out of candy cane. And that was odd, but it wasn't the problem. The issue was that he wasn't alone. Brooke Harrison, a bland, pretty blonde girl, was next to him. They were holding hands and laughing together about some private joke in a very obvious couple way. She turned around and stomped down the stairs before running through the hall to find her grandpa. Someone had commented on her by asking, Where's the fire, Dracula's daughter? 
but she ignored them. They were all the same to her. She found her grandpa in the cafeteria drinking coffee with a couple of retired teachers, all wearing identical ugly Christmas sweaters. She hissed at him that she wanted to leave. Grandpa thought at first she was sick, but she simply barked that out that she wanted to leave. He gave the man he was talking with an apologetic look before walking Millie to the car. When she was locked inside, she began to stifle her sobs as her grandpa tried to figure out what was wrong. But he couldn't understand, he still didn't understand her. He asked her if someone had said something rude to her, which only made her angrier. Nobody at school said anything to her because nobody at school ever talks to her. Nobody at school cared whether she was alive or dead. Tears didn't stop rolling down her cheeks. Nobody could understand. No money, simple. Like the people who got excited over Christmas sweaters, baking cookies, and all the fake, happy stuff ordinary people fill their minds with to ward off their fear of death. Millie wasn't afraid of death, though. Right now, with her emotions boiling over, he felt like her only friend. We certainly are picky, aren't we? Yeah, no. For someone who wants the end result, we're awfully pussy about how to achieve it. But there's a lot more options. <laughs> I feel like a waiter talking my way through a menu at a fancy restaurant. The difference, of course, is that one menu gets you fed. The other menu gets you dead! <laughs> I cracked myself up. <laughs> Since I was talking about food, how about boiling? Did you know that Henry VIII made boiling alive the official form of punishment during his reign? Funny that they call it boiling alive. Because goodness knows you don't stay alive for very long. But I could easily flood my insides with water, then use my energy stores to bring the temperature up, up, up! First it would feel like a nice warm bath, but then it would just keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter! I wonder if you turn red like a lobster! Please don't boil me alive. <laughs> alive? I just want to live. I don't want to die. I know I always thought it was all pointless, but I haven't even done anything with my life. Is my purpose truly just to die by this machine? The final day before winter break arrived. The cafeteria was louder than usual with the excitement of seeing family and what people were doing on their break. Amelia sat miserably at her table, reading her book. But then, Dylan sat across from her, acting like absolutely nothing was wrong. He was so casual with his greeting and opening up his ketchup packets. Amelia outright asked how he could even sit across from her. Dylan, however, wasn't understanding her reaction. This was where he had always sat during lunch period. Millie snarkily commented on how she thought he would have preferred to sit with Brooke, but Dylan calmly said that she had a different lunchtime than him. Millie felt her anger rising. She asked if she was just his backup plan, but the comment only made Dylan more confused. His obliviousness had only heightened her expiration, but then a look of realization came across his face. Dylan realized that she thought they were dating, or at the very least Millie thought in the future they were going to date. Millie had to tell herself not to cry when he eventually apologized, saying he was sorry if he was misleading. She had been smart, pretty, and a great person. But he was looking for a friend, and she seemed like a cool person. But the reassurance and apologetic tone he put on only made Millie more upset, commenting on how he clearly had met more interesting people like his girlfriend, Brooke. Dylan's expression changed, and he asked point-blankly 
if she had even talked to Brooke. Millie responded that she never had. Brooke was quiet and appeared basic and blonde. Dylan, who also questioned why her hair color mattered at all, was disappointed by how Millie, of all people, was judging someone by how they appeared. The Billy did not see the hypocrisy of Millie not liking when people judge her appearance, yet she does the exact same thing. Dylan got up and left Millie to eat alone again. Probably for the rest of her entire time left in high school. Which suited her just fine. At least, that's what she told herself. As the winter holiday approached, Millie's mood became grimmer and grimmer. Cold air and darkened skies matched her mood perfectly, and all the bright light and smiling snowmen in front of people's yards were starting to get to her. If she heard Winter Wonderland again, she couldn't be held responsible for her actions. All that reminded her about were the lies. All day cheer, peace on earth, and the goodness presented in humanity were all lies people told themselves. Ironic, this cheery holiday took place around winter. Winter was the season of death. During dinner, a day before Christmas Eve, Millie was having stir-fry with her grandpa. She told him that she wasn't going to celebrate Christmas this year. She refused to be happy because society told her to. Her grandpa, confused, told her that Christmas isn't about society, but family. It's about enjoying each other's company when families from all over get together and celebrate and have fun. And the party that Grandpa had planned for tomorrow had the whole Fitzsimmons family coming over. Even Millie's parents were going to call on Skype. Millie, however, didn't listen, saying that she would be present but refused to participate in the festivity. Grandpa Fitzsimmons chagrined and openly told her that she has become particularly unhappy for the past few days. He wondered if it had something to do with him. He had tried to make her feel comfortable, but he is an expert on what young girls like Millie are dealing with nowadays. He suggested that maybe if she is unhappy here, she could go live with her parents in Saudi Arabia instead. Millie reacted by shouting about how she didn't miss her parents. She wasn't sure if it was true, but she was still mad at them for being gone. Grandpa asked them if there was a problem at school, maybe a fault with a friend. Millie just shouted that she didn't have any. Millie stormed out of the kitchen up into her room. She closed the door and opened up her laptop and played Kurt Karen's music on YouTube. The video was filled with bats circling vultures, and in the center of it all was Kurt Karen himself growling his morbid lyrics. It looked just like her depiction of death. Black hair, a pale complexion, and black eyeliner were perfectly applied. Nobody could understand her, not even Kurt Carrion, but maybe, just maybe death would. Should be with my parents. 
They may have been weird, but I loved them. I loved how my dad would tell me the worst puns, or how mom used to read me stories when I was little. They had always made me feel safe. It was Christmas Eve at Grandpa's house, and Christmas music was blasting downstairs. All day, jingle bells and white Christmas being sung by our family so off-key that a judge on one of those singing TV shows would probably have a stroke. When I level volume downstairs, it seemed like everyone had come, except her parents, of course. Her grandpa called down to her that she at least should say hello. She reluctantly dragged herself downstairs. It was best to get over done with anyway. All of them were wearing awful looking Christmas attire. They are surrounding a large punch bowl that Grandma must have stored somewhere in his house of antiques and knickknacks. They all greeted her brightly with a cheerful Merry Christmas. Mother was still wearing her usual black attire, which clashed with the bright colors that surrounded her. Her uncle asked if she was going to a funeral, or was in the morning, but Grandpa had to explain to him that she wasn't celebrating Christmas this year. Billy had to stifle her groan as the family around her acted either overly confused or dramatically shocked. Her nephews tried to get her excited about gifts and presents, but she knew the world was already too materialistic already. Her aunt offered her an eggnog, but that was like drinking snot. And everyone offered her to come sit with them, have food and sing together. But what was the point of it all if they were all going to die anyway? Millie couldn't take it. She had to leave. She told her grandpa without looking at him that she was going on a walk. As she headed out the door, grandpa called for her to remember her coat, but she just ignored him. The walk did nothing but make her cold. As she walked a lap around the neighborhood, all she saw was festive decor outside. Everyone is the exact same. Present, eggnog, cheer, all of it was hypocrisy. But Millie was different from all of them. She wasn't going to participate. She wouldn't be a hypocrite. Hypocrite. That word stung as it reminded her of Dylan. Dylan had called her a hypocrite because she judged on appearance. But boys, even one who seemed cool like Dylan, were fooled by appearances of girls. If they had pretty blonde hair and paid attention to them, they believed their saints and geniuses all rolled into one, in her opinion. Millie wasn't a hypocrite. She was a truth teller. If people couldn't handle the truth, that was their problem. As she completed her lap, she stood outside Grandpa's house, dreading the prospect of going back inside, until an idea popped into her head. Grandpa had kept the power running his workshop, including a space here during the winter to keep all the electronics from freezing inside. It would be nice to get out in the cold, and it could be a place to wait until their family left Grandpa's house. She rushed over to it and opened and closed the wooden door behind her. The place was even more cramped than the house. Scraps from flea markets, garage sales, and landfills cluttered to every nook and cranny and table. Billy never understood Grandpa's obsession with collecting all this junk. It was to keep his mind off things. They were old bites, mechanical toys, and a pile of monkey dolls with symbols. But the strangest item among them all was tucked in the corner of the workshop. It was some kind of mechanical bear with a bow tie, top hat, and a creepy blank grin. Its outer shell was colored a degrading white pink, and it was big enough that a person could fit inside its torso if they climbed inside. Perhaps it was part of one of those children's attractions that used to populate the area before they went bust. Millie never went to them, but if they looked as creepy as this... Clown bear. They produce nightmares. Millie would have loved it, maybe with a shade of a darker tone, but if they had this uncanny appearance that Millie appreciated, how did kids find these things endearing? From outside the workshop, Millie heard laughter. Her stupid younger cousins were playing with the snow outside. She had locked the workshop, so if they came in, they would tell everyone where she was. She couldn't let them find her. Millie stared at the mechanical bear at first curiosity. But now she looked at it as a possible solution. The belly of the bear acted like a mechanical doorway to a body cavity. 
she could crawl inside and shut the door behind her. And she did. Darkness enveloped her, which was much more preferable than the annoying colors of Christmas sweaters. It was perfect. No one to bother her, no one to pull her into singing Christmas carols. So what if she missed Sky with her parents? Serve them right for being so far away. After a while, Millie's eyes began to get heavy. The sound of the workshop inside of the machine was surprisingly soothing. In a few minutes, she was asleep. I don't have a sword like a Saudi Arabian executioner, silly Millie. But, but I do have a sharp sheet of metal I could pass through my chamber. I could pass at the level of your throat. Or it could hit your lower half to bisect you. And bisection is a sure way to go, too. Either way, the job would get done. Maybe I could kick the door to his belly open? Worth a shot. <laughs> I think it would be smooth like a Madame Guillotine instead of a slow, dull hacking like Mary, Queen of Scots experience. But I'm not 100% sure. This will be my first attempt at decapitation. You too! But it'll also be your last. My stupid torso won't budge no matter how hard I push. There's a crack in his upper torso. It's an opening. Millie? Are you still with me? A decision must be made! The door is locked tight. I can't get out unless he opens it himself. When he goes to swing at me, I might be able to see when he makes the motion through the opening. If I lower my head and curl up in a ball, I might be able to dodge the blade. I'd have to be quick so he doesn't notice, but... Is there... Anything I could give you in exchange for my life? Lamp shut up! There's nothing I want from you! Except your life! Okay. Then decapitation it is. Really? Good choice! It's a classic! I promise you won't be disappointed! Well, you won't be disappointed! Cause you'll also be dead. But I promise to do a good job. T tell me when you're about to do it. Don't just spring it on me. Fair enough, I suppose. It's not like you're going anywhere. Give me a few minutes to get ready. You know what they say. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. I have to die for. Those are crimes that everybody is guilty of from time to time. True! That's why they're crimes of humanity! But if there's something all humans are guilty of, then why do I have to die for them? Because you're the one who crawled in. Please, if I get out of this, I promise I will make a point to be nicer to Grandpa. In the spirit of the French Revolution! He had been so kind and takes my bad moods without any gripes. How about do a countdown in bed before releasing the blade? I promise to be nicer to my family. Good! 
I promise to be nicer to others. Duh! I promise to change. Grandpa Fitzsimmons was cleaning up the dishes when the rest of the Fitzsimmons clan was preparing to open gifts. The gifts were, of course, excited. They barely were able to hold on to their hot cocos. When the kids asked if they should get Millie, Millie's Uncle Rob asked why they should care if she was acting like a brat. Grandpa Fitzsimmons frowned that word. She wasn't a brat. She was just a difficult age. She would come around. She just needed to experience life at her own pace. And when she was ready to open up, he'd be there for her if she needed him. Grandpa crouched on the tree and arranged all the presents in a big pile. So they'd be there for her when she came back. soul shall find itself alone mid dark thoughts of the gray tombstone not one of all the crowd to pry no one to hear your final cry you may call me mad but the true question is not yet settled whether madness is or is not the loppiest intelligence when we live in a world where the boundaries which divide life from death are at best shadowy and vague, who shall say where the one ends and where the other begins? <laughs> With that said, I think we have reached a perfect stopping point. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to stay updated, please consider subscribing, following, or sharing this podcast. It truly helps us broaden our reach. And consider following us on our Twitter at Fazbear Podcast or supporting us on our Buy Me a Copy page using the link in the description below. If you're curious as to what we have planned next, the long awaited episodes covering Security Breach are in the works. However, we are going about these episodes a little bit differently than the others, so it'll take some more time. So what does that mean? Well, the answer will be in our next episode, another question and answer session. Next episode, we will have an update on the show, as well as answer questions directly from the fans. They could be FNAF lore questions, theories you'd like to submit and hear feedback on, or just questions about me or the show. Use the link in the description to go to our Twitter, where you can submit your questions. This episode was also a lot of work, and I had a ton of help with it. Count the Ways is by far the most popular story in the Fast for Fright saga, and I wanted to do it justice. So, I'd like to thank the talented at Springy in the Cartoon Studio for his amazing performance as Funtime Freddy, as well as Aaron underscore voiceover for voicing Millie Fitzsimmons. Our thumbnail art was also done by the talented Brad, Twitter handle at they Inc. If you enjoy his work, please give him a shout out on Twitter, and if you want to own, some of it yourself. Our merch store has just recently released some Count the Ways t-shirts and posters for the occasion. And if you're wondering why I went on that huge spiel in the beginning about the importance of life, well, Christmas has always been very important to me. I know it's Halloween, and maybe it would have been more prudent to save the story for Christmas, but Christmas is the one time of year I think we should all take to remember better parts of life. It doesn't matter if you don't celebrate Christmas, holiday, time in general. 
and it's these and it's that time of the year, that end of the year when snow falls in the west and we all remember and think back fondly. We all become better people out of it. But those people, they don't have to be just there on Christmas or there during December. They're you. They're Millie. Just remember, you're all worth it, guys. Every life has a purpose, and every person is worth it. You are all worth it. Once again, I've been your host, Nick, and thank you for listening. Have a good night.